The Center for Educational Media and the College of Education at Middle Tennessee State University are proud to offer professional development to K-12 educators in Tennessee through our online video library. These videos are aligned with standards set by the Tennessee Department of Education. For more professional development videos, check out our website at cem.mtsu.edu. Allison McAvoy is the Director of Curriculum and Instruction at Southeast Reading Center in Chattanooga, Tennessee. She is Orton Gillingham trained and is also a Wilson credentialed trainer and Wilson dyslexia therapist. She has most recently received um, certification with the Center for Effective Reading Instruction as a Structured Literacy Dyslexia Therapist. Allison has many years of experience in special education and spent 11 years as lead teacher for the Hamilton County Education Department. She is currently serving as Area 3 Director for the Tennessee Branch of the International Dyslexia Association and as a member of the Tennessee Dyslexia Advisory Council. Allison McAvoy. So I'm glad everybody's here as it's already been said. I think we've had a, a great session so far. Um, and I can already see um, some, prior, uh, some directions of where we can go next uh, to, uh, to continue with empowering parents, uh, just from some conversations that what I've heard people talking about. So I wanna talk about uh, accommodations and self-advocacy uh, as we continue talking about uh, uh, the parts of the, how we can help all of our students and help our parents as well. So I'm gonna, my talk's gonna be, I'm gonna divide it up into three parts. Um, accommodations and modifications, IDEA, which is the special ed law, and then section 504, which is the, uh, the law for students, um, a non-discrimination law uh, for students as well. And then talk about advocacy. So I like to start off when we talk about accommodations, um, take a look at this picture. So when we talk about accommodations, what we're really meaning is that we want to give students access. Access to the grade level standards, access to whatever uh, everybody else is doing, non-disabled peers. And um, I think Bradley said it earlier, um, fair does not always mean equal. Equity does not always mean equal. You get what you need. And I think this is a good picture that kind of describes that. We want to watch this ball game and we give everybody the box to stand on. Well, that's great for two of them, but one of them is still being left out there. So we want to make sure that we're giving them what they need, what our students need to be successful and also to access their grade level, be able to do what you're doing for the grade level. So this is when we talk about accommodations. This is what we want to keep in mind here. What are we trying to do? It's not give everybody the exact same thing, but it's give students what they need to be successful. Um, so with the accommodations, it's where we're really trying to level the playing field. We're trying to make that disability or that, uh, that uh, uh, learning problem that you have to have less impact. So we're trying to just make sure that students have exactly what they need. We want to give e equitable access during instruction and assessment and assessments. So during the regular classroom, what's going on during the typical day, but also on high stakes tests, talking about those accommodations as well. When we talk about accommodations, what we're talking about is we're changing how the student is taught, how the material is presented to them, or how we get them to that information. We're not changing what we're asking them to, to do. We're not, that's a modification. We'll talk about the differences because sometimes people use them interchangeably and they're not the same thing. So we'll kind of look at that. Uh, and again, it's intended to reduce or lessen the effects of the student's disability or whatever learning struggle that they're having. Uh, we want to make sure that accommodations should be, um, help the students participate more fully um, and be able to tell you what they know. Because a lot of kids have, they have the knowledge, they just don't have the way that they're able to put that, to give that back to you. If they have difficulty with writing, they may not be able to write the five paragraph essay that's requested, but they can do a five paragraph essay if you just give them another way to do it. So we wanna make sure that we're giving the students the access and, and helping them be able to do that. Um, it needs to be based on an individual student need and not on a category. 
So all students who have dyslexia are not going to need the exact same accommodation. So it's not based on their, uh, their disability or the area that they're struggling with. It really needs to be on an individual basis. Some students may need read aloud. Other students, it drives them crazy because it's like, I, I can't. I can't think. I can't process. So what is going to be effective for that particular student to look at that? Um, and we'll look at the laws in different places when we talk about that, is that you really want to make sure that the accommodation is going to work for that student. Um, it does need to be provided on a regular basis. Uh, my background is in special education, and so there are a lot of times it's like right before the high stakes testing, we need to get this child some accommodations. That's not going to help. We need to make sure that we're giving those accommodations all year long when they need it and not just on the high stakes test because all of a sudden they're like, well, I don't know how to use this. I don't know what to do with this. Um, I'm not sure. And you're not, you, it's not, you don't want to give it an unfair advantage. That's not what the purpose of accommodations are either. It's just to level that playing field. And we really want to, when we're talking about accommodations, it's really about helping the student become independent. You don't want the student to be so dependent on those accom accommodations that they can't function without it. And it's all going to be dependent on the age of the student. So younger students, you know, you may have um, some accommodations that you have in place that they're very, very dependent on. But as they get older, you want them to be able to access those a little more um, independently and be able to use those more independently as well. One of the nicest things about um, the technology that we have available today is that there's, there's a lot of things that you can put in place that helps that student become more independent. Uh, think about one of the a very typical uh, accommodation is to read aloud. The student, it may be a fifth grade student, not able to read at the fifth grade level, they're, and so they're not able to access that test, so they need somebody who's going to read that to them. Uh, many times it's like they have to, then they, sometimes they have to wait until somebody's available to read that to them. There's so much technology now that the computer can actually, you can just scan it in and the computer will read it to them. There are reading pens that will do that. So that, that helps them become more independent to say, I don't have to wait on somebody to come do this you know, for that time. I can be with my peers and do this in real time. So we'll talk about, you know, we'll look at some of those, um, how do you get some of those things? How do you access some of that? Um, accommodations should not. They should not remove the instructional content or standards. So if the class is reading Moby Dick, then that's the standard. Now the student may not be able to read Moby Dick. How can they access that? Audio, audio, audio books, some other way with that. We don't want to el eliminate participation or opportunities within general education. So we're not going to take them out of something that they're not going to have access to that, uh, that activity. Not only introduced at high stakes testing. So we want to make sure that this is something that they use on a regular basis that they're doing all the time. And not provided solely as a way to ensure proficiency. So I'm going to give you this accommodation because it's going to help you get that step up. It's not what it's there for. It's really just all about access, giving every student what they need. When we talk about accommodations, there are generally four different ways that you can accommodate. Um, through a presentation, which is going to change the way that the information is presented. Um, a response accommodation changes the way the student completes the assignments. Or test, the setting is going to be changing the setting, the environmental setting. And we'll look at some of these in a little more detail. Or timing or scheduling. So these are generally the areas when we talk about present, uh, accommodations of where, what you can change within the environment for that. So a presentation accommodation, uh, some examples. Now, this is not an exhaustive list. There are a lot of different ways that you can accommodate. These are just some of the more common ones uh, and they're typically discussed. But if, you, if you've got something that your, your, your child does well with, introduce it to the team because it may be something that you know just from working with your own child that's a good accommodation. But these are very typical ones. Um, listening to audio recordings instead of reading a text. So again, if that student is not able to read at that level, then you want to make sure that they have access to that text. We're not going to say, OK, well, you don't have to read this. Read this at your level. You still want them to be at those content standards at their grade level. Uh, work with fewer items per page or line. 
Notice that this is not saying that I'm cutting the assignment in half, because that would be a modification. We'll talk about that. But maybe that the page is there's too much information on it. So it's overwhelming, so that I can change it. I can make more space. I can make it larger. I can make it where it's like, OK, oh, I can do this. I can handle this part of it. Finish it, move on to the next piece. So just you can change how much information is presented on a page. Um, have a de designated reader, someone who reads those test questions, um, allowed to a student. Uh, again, and I love the fact that there is so much technology uh, now that can help uh, 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 alleviate a lot of that. A lot of schools now are giving Chromebooks to students. And that's a great way to be able to, that, that students don't look any different than anybody else. You have it on your Chromebook. You're able to access uh, whatever information that you need with that. Um, here, instructions spoken aloud. So maybe I can't read the instructions. I need somebody to read them to me so that I make sure that I understand what it is you want me to do. Record a lesson, and I think you talked about that, that you were very visual, that you needed to have that, you needed to hear it again. Uh, so maybe I need to, I can't take the notes. I have difficulty with the handwriting, so I want to make sure I can't keep up with it. I need to focus on what's being said. So maybe I record it, uh, or uh, maybe the teacher gives me notes, or maybe another student gives me notes, so that I've got that information there. Um, get an outline of the lesson, use visual presentations of verbal materials, such as word, word, word webs, or getting a written list of instructions. So just whatever. Again, it's not an exhaustive list here. There are a lot of different ways that you can accommodate that presentation. Um, some different response, uh, response, give responses in a different form. So maybe um, I give you, I, you want a test and I, you know, I, I give it to you orally. Or I, you know, you need me to write a paper, I do a speech to text so that I'm able to get that information out, but it's just not in the exact same form that, that everybody else is doing it. Uh, dictate answers to a scribe who writes or types. Um, for, a, for an assignment, it means a very different thing when you're talking about high stakes tests, when you talk about a scribe. Um, if you're doing homework, and your child is just having difficulty with that, it's like, okay, I'm gonna write the answers for you, you tell me. So you just, you know, you tell me the answers and I write it down. On a high stakes test, like the, the Tennessee assessment that they're gonna take, that they always take in the spring, what that means is that you have to say, you have to tell the, the scribe everything. So on my sentence is the, so capital T, H E. You gotta spell everything out. So it's very different when we're talking about on a high stakes test than on just a regular assignment. So check if they say, well, we're gonna do a scribe. That means something very different on a high stakes test than it does just with an, with an assignment. Um, use a spelling dictionary or a digital spell checker. Uh, uh, proce word processor, and again, that could be, a, could, could be a computer, could be a laptop, it could also be uh, text to speech. It's going to be they, they dictate their information and it translates it into that. Um, use a calculator or table for math facts. So just different, again, just different ways to look at that response. Setting accommodations, I think probably everybody's pretty familiar with this. Um, I need this student to come sit right by me, the teacher, because they can focus better if I'm right there with them. Uh, so that's a very typical one is, uh, is that proximity of where the teacher is and where the student is. Um, but ha talk to the student too about where do you learn best. If I sit by the door, the classroom, the hallway is making too much noise. I can't think. I, can't, I need to be somewhere else. Maybe uh, we're doing group work, but four is too many for me. Maybe I need two students to work with. Maybe I prefer to work by myself. I think better that way. You can't always, you know, sometimes you need to learn how to work in a group, so there could be some of that as well. But then sometimes it's like I do better if I'm with somebody or I'm better if I, I'm by myself. Um, take tests in a small group or, or a, a special setting. So a lot of times if there's testing, if you, there are students who have to have that read aloud, they'll take them to another setting and read those uh, assessments or tests or questions uh, to them in a small setting. Uh, special lighting or acoustics. There are some kids, fluorescent lights just really make a humming sound and just really kind of bug. Uh, can be very distracting. So just being aware of those types of things uh, with those accommodations. 
uh, timing and scheduling of accommodations, take more time to complete a text or a project, allow extra time to process, so give the student that thinking time. They may be able to, a lot of times, um, students with dyslexia have those word retrieval problems. They, they, they know what they want to say, they just can't quite come up with it. So give them that little time to just kind of process that, think about what it is you're asking them to do, give them that opportunity, that think time, before to, to respond. Frequent breaks. Some students, it's overwhelming um, the, the amount of stuff that they have to do. And a lot of kids, especially who are struggling readers or have dyslexia or just have any kind of disability, they've been in school all day long, they've held it together, now it's time to do homework and you get everything that's left. You get the explosion because they've held it all together all day long. So give them frequent breaks. Talk about some of those accommodations. Will you have to write 15? Well, let me write it for you. Or, you know, you tell me the answer. So accommodations are something that can be put in place to help the students with that. Um, take a text, uh, take a test um, uh, several, a uh, certain time during the day. I do better in the morning. So if, if there's any way to do it, let me take the test in the morning. If I take it at the end of the day, it's gonna be very different because for whatever reason, I've been in school all day long, I don't have anything left to do well on that test. Um, take sections in a different order. So maybe it's like, I wanna do the reading test in the morning, I do better in math in the afternoon. So just looking at, these are all accommodations that are totally acceptable and can be put into place for students. Um, one of the things when we talk about accommodations that I think is really important is to make sure that you have the student involved in the process. Um, because I've, I've worked with a lot of kids and it's like, well, that doesn't work for me, but nobody ever asked them. Does this help you? No, it drives me crazy when you do that. Uh, but, we're, but you've put this in place, and so I, I feel like I have to do it. So really get the students to, to talk to you, your child to talk about what works best for you. Uh, well, let's try this. Maybe it works, maybe it doesn't work. And then change it up uh, so that you are making sure that that's really working for the student. So I think even for young kids, get them involved in the process of what's going on, uh, what helps, what, what doesn't work. Well, let's try this, or here's something that we can try or mom, that doesn't work for me, but this might. And I get the kids because they may say, well, you know, if we did it this way, I think it would work for me. But they have a lot of understanding of themselves about what they think might work best for them. Uh, so just always, I think it's really important to have those students involved as well when you're talking about what you're doing because you, because you're making a plan for them. Um, I think, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say um, that I've encountered this a lot this year with my daughter um, where I thought she was just stalling or just blabbering and and when I took when I took her comments seriously about like I do handwriting better when I'm listening to the iPod or you know when I when I just believed her and she kn she knew way better than I did you know and I don't know if it was like the validation of her mom saying, yeah, okay, I believe you, you're right, let's do that, even though it seems counterintuitive to me. Wow. Mm -hmm. But um, they really know, it, they you know? And, and also, I, you know, I'm not dyslexic, so her brain works so much different than mine. So oftentimes her solution for self-accommodation is much different than anything I would have thought about, right. you know? And I think, I think that's a very good point, is to get them. We were talking to somebody, we went to the, um, it, may, it may have been Carmen, at the uh, IDA conference last week is that some people like, it would drive me absolutely crazy to have music on while I'm trying to study because I just can't focus that way. Others, it's like it helps, and I was like, yeah, it was. Yeah, so an adult friend of mine said, I have to have music playing when I'm working on something really complicated because it babysits that part of my brain that gets me in trouble. <gasps> wow. Right, so think about that, that's yeah. that sort of ADD thing going on. It's like, I'm gonna be fiddling and futzing and doing all sorts of things, but when I have music, which is hard because in school, mm -hmm. you really can't have music going on. So what do you give that child that really needs something else to babysit the part of the brain? Because that's a really, like uh, Brad was talking about, it's a really ADD thing. There's so much going on there at once. So maybe we can come up with some technology. <laughs> well, <laughs> all the high schoolers school. have AirPods. 
True, but right. they're usually not allowed. That's an easy enough accommodation to have, them on. To have that and in their IEP. And convince a teacher that it's okay for them to be listening to. <laughs> a lot of teachers anyway, have but embraced it's a very it, valid, yes. a very valid. It's okay thing. as long as you're yeah. working. Yeah, and something that seems totally crazy to me is going to work for somebody else. And, and you, know, you think you're exactly right. It's a counterintuitive. It doesn't seem like it would work, but we all learn differently. It's, and our brains are all wired differently. So that something that works for me may not work for somebody else. So I think that's really important, even at a very young age, get the students involved, um, get your children involved in what works, what doesn't work. Let's try this, let's try that. One of the things with accommodations that I think that is very important is that the accommodations don't eliminate the need for the student to continue to learn the new skills. So it can't be the, well, okay, you can't read at grade level, so we're gonna accommodate everything, but we're not gonna teach you how to read. I think that you know, we, the accommodation is this, just there to help give you access while we still continue to teach you how to read or, or math or whatever the, the disability is that we want to do with that. Um, so I think really important with that. When I was putting this together, um, I, I, my main sources of information, and I think this is important, is, is we're in Tennessee, although I've heard earlier that we may have some people who are uh, outside of Tennessee, is looking at what Tennessee provides. So on the Tennessee website, uh, this comes from the special ed framework, which was updated in August 2018. Lays out the special ed pro, uh, process, lays out who the IEP process, everything there, um, and it puts that information in there. When we talk about the IDEA, which we're gonna move to in just a minute, and the section 504, there's a framework on the Tennessee State website as well for Tennessee of that section 504. So resources that are already there and available that talk about how Tennessee recognizes this or defines this. So we've got federal law, we've got state law, and then your districts. When we talk about the different laws, federal law sets the standard. The state has to meet that standard. They can go above that standard, but they can't go below that standard. Same thing when we go to districts. Districts can have to meet that state standard. They can go above that standard, but they can't go below. So just kind of looking at that, so it's driving, but those, those laws are in place to help make sure that everybody knows and is working on that goal. Um, so I think really important uh, to talk about this. Another excellent uh, source is understood.org. If you guys have not familiar with understood.org, it is a ton of information that is very, very useful. You can put in anything and you're gonna get a, a thousand different articles talking about it. So it's gonna, um, it just if you look at my child is, you know, um, I wanna learn more about federal law or I wanna learn more about ADHD or I wanna learn more about dyslexia. Understood.org is a wonderful resource uh, to give you that information. So accommodations are in place to help the student access the curriculum at their grade level. Modifications are different. Um, for, and usually are, are, we talk about for students who may need changes in the curriculum and learning. So it, it changes what the students are learning. So if I've got a student who's a fifth grade level and I need to make a modification because they're not able to do that, then I change, maybe I'm gonna have them do something on a second grade level. It's very different than when just accommodating when we talk about the modifications there. So here are some examples of just some common modifications. Uh, complete fewer or different homework problems. Uh, write shorter papers. So maybe the standard is that you're gonna write five paragraphs. Um, and I'm going to get a, your, your, my modification for you is you're only going to write one. So you're changing what the student is expected to do there. Answer fewer or different test questions. Uh, create alternate projects or assignments. Learn different material, get graded differently on the assignment, or be excused from particular projects. So those, and it, there's, it's a, can be a little, like is it an accommodation or is it a modification? So just kind of think about it. Are you changing what is expected for the student to be learning with that? Um, I think a great example with, in modifications because it's like you want to make uh, it access easier for students. 
I worked with a teacher, this is a number of years ago before we had um, so much access to the technology and so many different ways to do it. And I worked with a teacher, her daughter had cerebral palsy. And so the writing was really, really, really difficult for her. And she asked that the mom, who was a teacher, said, can, we, can she do half the assignment? And the teacher was like, sure. And the daughter's like, but mom, I'm not gonna be tested on half of the material. So I need to know all of it, so I have to do this assignment. But how, what would be some ways that we, the, they could have talked about it to accommodate that? Students still learned all the information, but maybe didn't have to write it all out. So still learn the information, but we just accommodated it differently. So kind of thinking about it, it's not trying to lessen or change the expectation, but how do we give them access to it? So when we talk about accommodation, now accommodations, there are teachers who accommodate, they see a need, a student having a, a problem, and they just accommodate naturally. Um, there's others that's like, nope, it's not in the IEP or the 504, I'm not making any changes to that. Um, so there are a lot of, so as we're gonna talk about the laws that kind of, you can put those accommodations into place. Even when Aaron was talking about the RTI, the RTI framework even talks about that teachers can make accommodations that they can change you know, differentiated instruction to meet the needs of the different student, of the students that they have in there. But if you need to have set accommodations that, that everybody agrees on and what's going on with, your, with, the, with the student and what's gonna be the best way for them to access the curriculum, we're gonna talk about uh, the laws that kind of those fall under. So it's the individual education, the IEPs for students who meet that criteria for special ed. Um, and then the Section 504, which is the uh, Rehabilitation Act uh, discriminations. There are a lot of similarities in these two. There are a lot of differences as well. So we'll kind of look at this. So this is just looking at both of the laws, kind of um, information about the general purpose of the law for both of these. This, you can find this in a couple of different places. This, um, I took it, some of this from the, uh, 504 framework that the State Department has uh, for the Section 504, and also from understood.org that does that side-by-side -side comparison to look at that. So with the IDA, it's a federally funded statute which provides financial aid uh, to states to help for those students who have been identified with a, with a uh, disability. So it's a blueprint for the child's special education program at school. 504 is much broader. It's a civil rights um, law, but it's not it's so that, to make sure that schools are, uh, that nobody's being discri discriminated against, being discriminated against. So it's a plan uh, for how the school will provide support and rem remove barriers for the students. So pretty similar in what, in, or what their purpose is. Um, what does it do? So in IDEA, there's an IEP, which is an individualized plan written for that student based on whatever handicapping condition they have that's going to meet their needs to progress in the regular in, within the curriculum. Uh, Section 504 uh, provides services and changes to the learning environment. So it's again having to give access to the students so that they can be able to participate in the curriculum. Um, as with an IEP, a fi 504 is provided at no cost to family, so there should be no uh, free appropriate education for both, uh, both uh, students with a disability under IDEA and students who are, have the disability under Section 504. Um, the definition, uh, what law applies, so under IDEA, it's that uh, the reauthorized law uh, from 2004. Uh, federal Education Law for Students with Disabilities, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. Federal Civil Rights Law, which is gonna be broader than what the IDEA is. Eligibility under uh, IDEA, uh, Aaron talked about this already. Uh, there are 13 categories of disabilities, so the students have to meet what the state, and, and it's, there's the federal law, and there's also the state law. In Tennessee, there are more, they've added functionally dis, uh, functionally delayed and uh, intellectually gifted uh, as categories. Federal law doesn't have those categories. Uh, so it's going to looks at the, the two prongs for that. You have to meet the state criteria and there has to be an adverse effect 
is how is it affecting your, your student educationally. Um, under 504, it's a broader. So it just has to be, um, does the student have a disability? Is the student perceived to have a disability? So it's a much broader category there. There's no criteria that you have to meet to say that this student has a disability. You still, you're still looking for, is there some kind of impact there that why that student needs to have accommodations or other uh, service or services or supports there. Again, both of them require appropriate a program designed to, to provide an educational benefit. And in Section 504, comparable to, an, to the education provided to non-disabled peers. With uh, special ed versus general ed, a uh, student is only eligible to receive IDA services. The IP de team determines that the student needs special education. And with the 504, student's eligible if he has a physical or mental impairment, which substantially limits one of the, learning, one of the processes, activity. They've broadened it so that now it includes learning, comp, uh, concentration, so learning. So a student with dyslexia would fall under, could fall under, I won't say will, could fall under Section 504 as well. When we look at who creates the plan, uh, IDEA is very specific on the process that you go through to look at uh, whether you're going to be, what you're going to go through to, to get that process for eligibility. Um, an IEP is created by an IEP team, it says very specifically who must be in that meeting. Must be the parents, at least one of the child's general education teachers, uh, at least one special education teacher, school psychologist, or specialist who can interpret the results uh, of the uh, evaluation, and a district representation uh, who has authority to say, uh, you know, you say, I, I, I want my child to have an assistive technology evaluation. I want to make sure that they get this. Then that person has to be able to say, okay, the district can provide that or will provide that. There are very few exceptions when the entire team does not have to be present. So this is your team of, of who should be at an IEP meeting. Um, with Section 504, they're less specific. Um, they generally, it's, it doesn't even say who has to be there. I was reading something that was like, they don't have to tell the parents. But I don't think that that's what most uh, places do. It's like they want the parents definitely involved. Created by a team of people who are familiar with the student and understand the evaluation data. And it might include the uh, child's parent, general education, special education teacher, school principal. So the rules are not as specific for the 504. Yes. Also, for those that might not know, you, they, you can graduate from an IEP to a 504, and we kind of learned that the hard way. My granddaughter that's on the autism spectrum, she, they felt like she had developed enough, you know, that she didn't need the IEP anymore. And then all of a sudden, we started seeing some of those still things that she really needed help with that was kind of holding her back. And so then we came back in and um, did the 504, so they can change. It can't change. It can't change. One thing that, yeah, so one thing that you, that is very important it to, for you to recognize as well, that is you as the parent or guardian are a member of that team and a member of that decision making process. Um, and so it's like it can't, the school can't just come and say, well, we're going to do this without your input and in saying, I agree or I disagree. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the, uh, if there are disputes or if there are, uh, um, you disagree, what are some of your options if you disagree with either an IDEA, uh, IEP, or a 504? But you would have one or the other, not both. You would not have both. Yeah, you would not have both at the same time. By, ne by definition, you could, because every student on an IEP would meet 504 criteria, because they are identified as a student with a disability but you have one or the other. Can you give an example of when someone would be on a 504 versus an IEP? When that graduation might take place? A little more specifically? Well, they, they may have gotten, learned some of the things that they were having trouble with, like even the, the, the handwriting or the, you know, if they were having trouble with handwriting and they were getting to use the scribes or things like that and graduate from that. 
and not need those kind of things anymore. Right. So there, there, there are times when you can exit out of an IEP, um, but it's, you, you, know, you really want to make sure that the data is there to support that the student doesn't need that any longer. Yeah, because it's a lot easier to, than going back. <laughs> to take it away and then try to get something put back in place is a little harder. Yes. Now you could have, now dyslexia is one of those things that could fall under, um, it's not, you don't meet the two prongs of the IDEA where you have, um, they meet the eligibility, it looks like they meet, but there's not an adverse enough effect that they just need accommodations to support, to, 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 yeah, to support that student. So they may not be may not be significant enough that, is, that they say, okay, it's IDEA meets the state guidelines for that, but a 504 plan would be very appropriate <laughs> to give that student those accommodations that they need to be able to access the general curriculum. Um, when we talk about what's in those different plans, again, IDEA is very specific about what components and what pieces have to be included in an IEP. Section 504, less specific. Um, with IDEA, child's present levels of performance, the annual education goal, so the students here, where do we expect them to be in a year's time? Uh, the services, when do the services begin? What services are we going to be providing? How long are those services? How many sessions per week? Any accommodations that the student might need? Any modifications? Um, how the child will participate in standardized tests? Um, and how the child will be included in general education classes and school activities. Is the child being pulled out, not going to participate in, and for whatever reason the child might not do with that. On a 504 plan, again, it's much broader. There's nothing specific. There's no form. Uh, each state is able to come up with their own. And then it goes even so much that each district can come up with their own as well. That it's much less specific. Evaluations. Consent required, uh, so your parent has to be notified uh, that they're going to look at uh, testing the student for special education services. Um, and reevaluations must be conducted every three years. Um, in Section 504, notice consent required prior to initial evaluation. This comes from the state ID, uh, Section 504. Federal is not as specific, like it's not as specific as whether who has to be notified and when it all comes. But that, and then the reevaluation is not as specific. Generally, it's every three years, but it's not specific to that. Uh, the IEP team, an IEP must be reviewed every year, can be reviewed more frequently than that. And uh, uh, for 504, it varies by state. Generally, it's reviewed every year, but there's nothing that says it has to be uh, this consistently. Fundings and cost. States are given, uh, districts are given federal funds, state funds for uh, students with IDEA. There are no additional funds for 504. So the 504 gets no additional funds and IDEA funds can't be used for 504. Very conscious and specific about we're gonna keep these funds separate. Uh, procedural safeguards. Um, and there are procedural safeguards for Section 504 as well. And I think sometimes that that's not communicated. It's like, nope, we're not going to do a 504, and you don't know, well, what can I do about that if I'm denied that? Um, so there are procedural safeguards with both. Um, with with uh, IDEA, it requires written notice regarding identification, evaluation, and placement. So anytime they're going to make a change with an IEP, you have to be notified, and you have to give prior written, they have to give you prior written notice before they do that. Um, with Section 504, written notice is not required, although it is recommended. Best practice, notify the parents that you're going to make a change. Uh, but if there's going to be a significant change in placement, like we're going to not do the 504 any longer, you want to make sure that the parents were notified of that. And we'll get into talking a little bit more about how to resolve disputes in just a little bit, but just kind of looking that there's a numerous pathways uh, if you have... Um, concerns or you're concerned that the IP or the 504 is not being followed, what can you do about that? Um, so there's mediation, due process complaint, resolution session, civil lawsuit, state complaint, just a lawsuit under IDEA. Um, under Section 504, you have many of the same types of things, mediation, 
an alternative uh, dispute resolution, an impartial hearing, a complaint to the Office of Civil Rights. So you can say, and the Office of Civil Rights will look to say, has there been a violation to the law? Has the student been discriminated against? So there are in both, there are processes that you can go through to say, I disagree with this. If you, you know, obvious, uh, we always recommend trying to work it out with the school, collaborating, collaborating and trying to work that out. But if you can't, there are other uh, steps that you can take um, if you're not uh, satisfied with the response you've gotten. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about advocacy. So now you've worked really, 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 really hard to get those accommodations into that IEP. And what are some of the pitfalls that can happen? What if your child says, nope, not going to do it? You know, what are some of the things that you can do with that? And what are some of the reasons why the child might not? Um, some is like, I don't want to stand out. I don't want to be any different. I don't want to look any different than anybody else. Think about uh, being in school and it's like, I want to I be looking like everybody else. I don't want to stand out in any way. Especially, you know, middle school, really don't want to look any different. It's a kiss of death to a kid. <laughs> right. Yes, it certainly can be the kiss of death. Yep. Um, worrying about how other students are going to react. I hear this sometimes, it's not fair. It's not fair that, that they get to do that and I don't. Remember, mm -hmm. it's not fair, it is not equal. Right. It's giving every student what they need to be able to access. Um, some think they're, think they're doing something wrong. Well, if I use this, then I'm doing something wrong. How do I access this? Not believing or understanding how it works. That's not gonna work. That's why it's really important to make sure that you have the student, your child involved. Is this going to work? Is this going to help? And really having those hard conversations, as Bradley was talking about earlier, as of, you know, it's going to impact your whole family. What are we doing? These are the things that are going to help you and, and getting the students to really understand that. Um, not wanting or knowing how to ask for an accommodation. That's a big one, too. Uh, so we put something into place, but I don't know how to go ask you for that. Or I don't know what I need to do to, to make sure that that's being done. And the accommodation doesn't work or help. So that's, again, we want to make sure if we put an accommodation in place, make sure we're checking. Is it making any difference? Is it helping? If it's not, let's change it. Let's drop it. Just because we, you know, we say we're going to try this, it doesn't mean that it's going to be in there forever. It may not work. A student may not need it any longer. So just kind of looking at if your child doesn't want to do that. Um, when we want to talk, so we want to help them to become, you know, even you're, the, you're your child's first advocate. So you really are helping, and especially for younger, younger children, you're the one going in and advocating for them. My child needs this. I need this. This is going to help them be successful. We want to start to get them more involved in it as well so that they can start self-advocating for themselves, um, especially as they get older. How can they ask for the things that they need? How can they become more independent? Because the goal is to get them more independent with this and be able to use these accommodations that are helpful for them. So understanding their specific needs. What are their strengths and weaknesses? I have a strength in this, but I have a weakness in this. So understanding. It's not, you know, the dyslexia doesn't define me. It's a part of me. I have the, so many other things that I can do that I can do well. But this, this is what I have weaknesses in and really understand and embrace that. Um, knowing what supports will help. And sometimes it's just trying different ones. You've got that list of things that, that can be helpful, uh, accommodations you can put in place. So choose some. Let's see if this helps. Let's see if this makes a difference. Let's see if this makes it easier for you. Um, does, do you need tutoring? Do you need classroom accommodations? And then communicating with uh, the, the needs to the teachers so that the teachers are well aware of it as well. There are um, some great, uh, on, again, on understood.org, some great, uh, some great um, Senate starters, just of like, how do I self-advocate for myself? Um, I, how do I go and ask a teacher that I need to do this or that I want to do this or that this would be helpful for me? So talk with your student about their strengths and weaknesses. Have those hard conversations. Uh, remind your, your child that asking for help is, is, is not a bad thing. Set up those times where you can practice that with your, in safe situations. 
I know it may be hard for you to believe, but I was a painfully shy child, painfully shy, that it was like I just didn't want to talk to anybody. You know, it's like if I was in my little zone and my mom would set up these little things and push me out there to try it. It's like, you're going to go ask this storekeeper this. You're going to go do this. And she was always in the background so that it's like, and it's like, okay, I'd go and I'd go do that. So setting it up the same way, role play. You know, if you're going to ask, um, like, like Bradley did with you, um, how do I ask for this? How do I come up and I, how do I talk to you about this? Um, find a safe teacher. Find somebody that you can practice. Practice with your child. Here's, how, here's what I need. Here's what I want to ask for. Get that feedback. As a special ed teacher, we would do that sometimes with students as well. We're going to push that child out a little bit. Here's a safe teacher that you can go and you can talk to. They know we worked it out with the teachers. Well, they know you're coming Just to ask for this so that you can role play this. What happens if it gets shut down? You want to teach them that as well. Who is the person in the school that, there's, that their go-to person is? It can't always be mom because you're not there. But who's your go-to person? A lot of times it's a special ed teacher. As a special ed teacher, a lot of times it was me. If you're having difficulty, if you're having problems with that, come talk to me. We'll, we'll work it out. We'll talk about resolutions. How can, we, how can we go self out? How can I help you support yourself to be able to go and do this? Praise your child's efforts for speaking up. It's a hard thing to raise your hand if you're a child in school to say, I need this. There are um, a couple of uh, contract type of things that you could say, the, here's the contract with the teacher. I need these accommodations. The student and the teacher agree on these things. Just a way to keep everybody involved, have the student part of that as well. Um, when, you're, when a problem does come up, give your child an opportunity to resolve that. Don't jump in so fast. Give them an opportunity to say, I'm going to try to try to do this on my own. Again, it's going to depend on the age of your student. Um, you know, a five-year-old, you can jump in there and help them a little bit, but a 15-year-old, see if they can resolve it themselves. Definitely get your students involved in that. Um, uh, state law, uh, when students hit 16, they have to be included into um, the IEP. They have to be invited. Tennessee actually says when they're 14. If it's appropriate for them to come when they're younger than that, have them come. You do not have to have them come sit in the meeting the entire time, but to have them hear the process, talk about what's going on, have them be able to give some feedback as well. Yes. How much actual say does a parent have in that IEP because the, what goes into the IEP? Because like, for example, Jackson, um, his teacher told mommy like, when she looked at his IEP, well, this is the same thing I do for every other student in the room. I mean, it was, there wasn't really anything on it. You got a lot of say. You have a lot of say. I think what she's, the principal said, well, we, we have to word things a certain way, and there's only certain things we can put into this IEP and how we're allowed to put things in there. Because the question was, is I said, this is what his teacher told me on a one-on-one -on -one meeting is everything that's in here i do all this for all of my kids mm -hmm. and any good teacher would they would assess the child put them where they need to sit and do things like this she said but so this iep means nothing to me is exactly what she said because i do this with all my kids so when we were in our last iep meeting i said would it be possible before our final iep meeting of the year to sit down with both of his teachers individually and say what would you add to this now that you know my child, the recommendations that need to happen? And the principal said, you need to talk to your teachers one-on-one, -on -one, maybe have them write a letter and give that to next year's teachers because we can't build an IEP on that. We're only allowed to put certain things into it. So you have to handle this your way because we can only put certain things into here and certain wording into an well, IEP. We know certain things that and that's, that's, that's totally not true. And, and that's where, you know, I'm like, what is technically allowed and what's not allowed? Because if you're telling me everything is basic, but you're telling me my child needs special help, how do I fix that? 
How do I get what I need into the IEP to better help my child? So I think that's going to be a whole nother Saturday that we, that we talk just about those types of things because it's a very valid point. And I think that power, uh, knowledge is power. So the more that we can educate you on what you can ask for and what you can say and how do you, so that you get a response like that, how do I respond back? What do I say? Like I pulled up when you said, you know, the accommodations and modifications are different. Like I pulled up his IEP while I was sitting here and they give him modifications, but there are no modifications in his IEP because they said we don't need them. But I know they're making modifications for him. They have 15 spelling words and my son only does nine. So then you want it, you want it in the IEP. That's what yeah. I said. I wrote it on here because I want it added. Like I want it focused on him. I don't want a generalized IEP. Because that next teacher is not going to know him like this teacher. Yeah. I want them to know my, when they look at the IEP, I want them to have, to know my child, to at least have a basic knowledge of him. Yeah. So, a, so, a, so an IEP should not be general. It should be individualized for that student. And that's not what they're, t they're saying. We can only put certain things in there. There's certain wording that has to that's, happen. That's and totally not true. And so I think I, I can see a whole new, a whole other session of let's talk about how do we do this and how do we, yes, absolutely. Because I, th I, think, that I think a lot of people are saying the same types of things and we need that. Yes, ma'am. I think this will clear it up really well because TennesseeStep.org mm -hmm. is a place to go. They have IEP they have workshops. Seminars. We've had them here at the Dyslexic Center. Aaron and Melinda can tell you that. And they, they're advocates, and that is, that's the one-line statement, I would say, that will be a, a great fix for parents. Get connected with Tennessee Step. Yeah, so she's saying the Tennessee Step uh, they, they do training and what they what step is trying to do is they're trying to empower parents to go and be able to do this themselves. Um, and so that takes knowledge, that takes knowledge. What is the IEP process? When, and, and I think it, when they tell you this, what do you say back? Right. What does the law say you can say back? Mm -hmm. All very, very important. So, and I think Tennessee step and I think TNIDA as well wants to do that too, to help empower parents. One more question in the back. Sharon, did you have a question? Yes. I have a question over here. How should a parent be proactive in the IEP process? How should the parent be proactive in the IEP process? One of the things that the state of Tennessee has said is that parents need to be able to be fully informed and be able to participate in the IEP process with that is that you need to know what the IEP says so that they are required if they do if they create a draft which most school districts do because you can't do a draft IEP at the time of the meeting there's just not enough time they must give that to you 48 hours before the meeting mm -hmm. that gives you the opportunity to see what's in the IEP what they're saying so that you can start to look at it and say uh, and some of the things real quickly that you want to look at, what are the goals? Do you, uh, what, what are the present levels? Do you understand what the present levels are saying about, about your student? Does it make sense to you? If you read it, do you know what it's saying? If you don't, then that's one of the other things that you want to say. I don't understand this. I explain this better. What are the goals? Are the goals measurable? Are they specific enough? If it just says at his instructional level, well, what's his instructional level? If I'm a fifth grader and my instructional level is on a second grade, what are we doing to get the student caught up to the fifth grade level? Also, compare IEPs. If you look at this IEP and you look at last year's IEP, it's the same present levels and the same goals, you're not making any growth. You go back and look at the other one, it's the exact same. There's no growth been made there. So look at, put all those pieces together and then, and then, and then get more information, more knowledge. So when you ask them questions and they get frustrated and they don't want to go to the next step and, and, and you're not really sure exactly what to do and you still want to be proactive, it's not an argument. You want your child educated. Yeah, but, but, with, yeah, and, but when they get frustrated and mad, I mean, they shut down. I mean, you can't, so, so that's what I mean by proactive. I mean, how can you, you, you don't know and you have to learn 
you know, it's it's a lot to take in for, you know, when you start at pre-K. Yes. And and they and they don't understand. They're they have no clue. In Hamilton County, they have no clue at all. So sometimes you may need to get an advocate. You may need to get an advocate to go with you to help navigate the process. But so does each school have their own policies and procedures? No. Okay. So a reading special, I mean, we even tried to ask what the reading specialist, I mean, how she was educated, how she kept up with everything. You couldn't even find that out. You have the right to ask those things. Well, so, so when, they, they, when they won't tell you. You need an advocate. You need somebody who's going to come in and say, who's impartial on your side, but can navigate the system, knows enough about the ins and outs of the laws and the games that can get played sometimes, and just to kind of work you through that process. So the advocate will definitely be a growth and a positive thing for the child I, in the school system and they will accept it. You, as a parent, you are entitled to, you are allowed to bring anybody that you wish to a meeting with you. So if you bring an advocate, they cannot say, that advocate cannot come in the building. That's like having a lawyer. Yes. So as a private tutor, I often go with my students to an IEP. All I have to do is walk in that door and then they know what I know, which is more than the parent knows, and that I'm not gonna let that parent sign anything that it hasn't been changed, as you were just saying, that isn't right for that child. I've never had an IEP where everything didn't come out the way it should in a very nice, gracious manner, but because they realized that they were bringing me and I have the background, the knowledge. If you don't knowledge. have the knowledge, they will try to right. steamroll. And I'm not an advocate, I'm a private tutor, and I go with my own students. I don't go out for, and, and IEPs for, you know, yes. but, it, but, it, but it works, because they say, oh, uh-oh, she, know she knows what she knows, <laughs> right. And that's and and it's important to say you don't have to sign. You don't have to. You do not have to sign an IEP. You do have to be careful with that because if you don't sign an IEP and you don't file something in writing as to why you disagree with it, it goes into effect after 14 days. I just wait until because they'll. I got it in before 48 hours before. I took my red pen, scribbled all over it, took it into the meeting. And she said, oh, I see you have a lot of red on that paper. <laughs> I yeah. said, yep. So I went through everything because if you don't have it beforehand, you won't, they kind of rush through it, right? Because they got the next meeting and they've only got a <laughs> sub to cover this planning period and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> so they're rushing you through. But if you know you've read through it, you've taken all your time, you know exactly what's on there and what questions you have and why is there no goal set for this? Or why are you saying this is a goal, but you're not going to support it? How are you going to support that goal? So you go through everything step by step. You have the time. You know what you're talking about. And then at the end, they're like, okay, well, we're going to make the changes, but just go ahead and sign this. No. I'll sit here and wait for you to make all those copies, and I'll sign it when it's done. Or we'll reschedule the meeting to right. go through this right. at another time. Right. Don't let them rush you. Right. Don't sign it until you've gone through everything. So again, this, this would be a whole nother workshop yeah. or, or, yeah. or look at the SPED um, program because they the do, the, I mean, the step. I've gone through it and it's amazing. They're great. Yeah. Yeah. So this is, uh, uh, if the school refuses to provide the accommodations or do whatever's in the IP, these are the options that you have for uh, filing a complaint. Generally, you work through it in this process, but you don't have to do it in that particular order. You can make it a uh, state of complaint, fill out a paperwork to the State Department that I'm concerned about this. Got to go. All right. Thank you, guys. More later. Oh, here's what I want to say. Last one. What, what, the goal for the accommodations and everything else is that very last one where we everybody, they just get what they need. Yay. All right. <laughs>